On today's show, I'm going solo because my co-host is addressing Locked On Cavs multi-billion dollar offshore accounts, but speaking of on the shore, the Cleveland Cavaliers dominated the New Orleans Pelicans down in the bayou. Hear about why on today's Locked On Cavs. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. As I had mentioned before, I am Evan Damerell. I am one of the voices of Locked On Cavs, the first podcast and sports podcast, period, to feature human voices that tickle your eardrums. But before I get started talking about the Cleveland Cavaliers uh, clipping the wings of the New Orleans Pelicans, I have to let you know this episode of Locked On Cavs is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just go to prizepicks.com forward slash locked on NBA. And use code all lowercase locked on NBA, like the National Basketball Association, for a first deposit match up to $100 dues. So, let's just get the elephant out of the room. Donovan Mitchell was back for this game against the Cleveland Cavaliers, and in my opinion, was the deciding factor for the Cavs. Uh, counting stats wise, Mitchell had 14 points on 5 6 shooting, 5 assists. Two fouls, four rebounds, a block, which I think really set the tone early into the game and what type of game this is going to be for the Cavs, but just really gave the Cavs an edge that they more or less have been lacking all season long. And I think in my opinion, I mean, you're leaning on the side of optimism considering that he had a pretty major knee procedure is something that will set the tone for the remainder of the season and head into the playoffs. I mean, <clears throat> before this game, the Cavs were 3-4 and four and 9-9 nine and nine on the season without Mitchell, so clearly he is impactful to winning despite maybe what some angry elf men that try to cut off my co-host's hands uh, may tell you, but it's tough just because like Mitchell is a dynamic force. He is center to everything the Cavs do on offense and defense. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, defense. Quinn Snyder's pinching air, uh, punching air rather, um, and it's it's just been tricky. But like Mitchell sets the tone for the Cavs. Um, it's a shot in the arm getting him tonight against New Orleans because it brought back normalcy to a Cleveland team that's trying to find its way into the postseason with with less than twenty games to go in the regular season, and it became a little bit more obvious because. Mitchell may no longer be eligible for MVP, but he uh, is the MVP for the Cavs in the court every night. Not just because of how impactful he is statistically, but his presence ensures the Cavs remain highly competitive. Without him, the blunders the Cavs have been showcasing lately would have continued against the Pelicans and become a little bit too commonplace, but... For what it's worth, Mitchell is really uh, steady things. And for context, statistically, like when he's on the court, the Cavs outscore teams 9.6 points per 100 possessions, averaging 118.4 points per 100 possessions overall. But when he's off the floor, uh, things get a little bumpier, and um, the Cavs are only able to muster 113.6 points per 100 possessions per game. And they're being, you know, roughly outscored by 2.2 points per 100 possessions just because based on Cleveland's defensive late rating. Um, in more simpler terms, for the nerds not named Chris Manning, uh, when Mitchell's on the floor, the Cavs boast a top three offense and a top two defense compared to the rest of the league. But when he's not on the court, whether it's due to rest or when he was hamstrung um, by injuries, or I guess in this case not a hamstring injury, but a nagging knee injury, uh, the offense is one of the league's 10 worst, and it's a slightly below average defense when compared to the rest of the league. And I think the numbers speak for themselves. Mitchell is and always has been a perennial All-NBA player. It's still wild to think that the first time he landed All-NBA honors was with the Cavs, but early into this game, he set the tone for Cleveland pretty early. Like I, I do wonder if it was by design by J.P. Bickerstaff to maybe kind of force feed Mitchell a bit, but there were two three-point attempts very early in this matchup that Mitchell connected on, but then he also set the two-way tone by getting that pretty emphatic block against New Orleans, and it kind of just led to a pretty strong tonal shift and a pretty strong momentum shift for the Cavs early into this game, and just led to a trickle-down effect 
for the rest of the team, whether it was Darius Garland, who we'll touch on more in the second segment, but I'll touch on more in a second here, or Isaac Okoro, George Niang, Jared Allen, like you name it. If they started for the Cavs or played minutes in the first quarter, they were part of the tone setters, which was spearheaded by Mitchell, the team's MVP. But I did just say I was going to touch on Garland, and I'm not a liar, to, despite maybe what... Um, the the haters that are the waiters at my table success may say but um garland has admitted in the past he's not 100 percent physically um he's underweight he's still playing himself back in the shape with the goal of being as close to 100 percent as possible by the time the postseason begins well we're not really that close to the start of the postseason in terms of just like days and games wise sure but the Cavs still have a healthy stretch in the regular, remainder of the regular season schedule to kind of iron out some of these kinks and deficiencies, but also just let Garland be comfortable and find more of himself within Cleveland's offensive flow with Donovan Mitchell kind of being centrical to everything. And I mean, overall, like, sure, Mitchell's counting stats weren't great. Um, he was 5 of 16 from the floor, like I said. Uh, he may be forced a few shots. I, I wonder if that is natural just because some of the rust that he was dealing with of missing several games for the Cavs. But I think Donovan Mitchell was phenomenal in his return for the court for the Cavs. And um, the, the spite of struck, strikes, uh, whatever you want to call it. But um, Cleveland did a phenomenal job just kind of getting him back in the flow of things and also just making him the number one option and kind of just keep curtailing and building their offense around them. And and as I look at it now, like with more clarity, like he did his damage in less than 28 minutes of action. So like he is still working his way back to the floor. It is going to depend on how his knee is feeling going forward. But all things considered with how up and down Cleveland was in their last 10, there were five and five in that stretch. Getting Mitchell back is a welcome reprieve for a team that was looking for some type of direction and a steady ship is always the best way to navigate in stormy waters even if you're the Cavs. but i want to focus more on darius garland in the upcoming segment also give a shout to george niang who is phenomenal in this game for the Cavs. but first you know it i know it we live in a capitalist society if you want to play the king's game you got to play the price and in order to do that i gotta get a quick word from today's sponsors Today's episode of Locked on Cast is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and to level it up with peak to, to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LEDs, headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, or a combination of all three or just two of the three ebay motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die you'll always find exactly what you're looking for and with the ebay guaranteed fit your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because of the ebay motors you're burning rubber not cash and with the parts you need at the prices you want it's easy to turn your car into the mvp like donovan mitchell and bring home that win keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com Eligible items only. Exclusion supply. eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. Coming back in hot and heavy. As you know, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel, Locked On Sports Today. Baseball fans, mark your calendars for March 20th at 7 p.m. EST. That is the time zone we live in for the best MLB season preview coming exclusively to Locked On Sports today. On March 20th at 7 p.m. EST, be the first to get local insight from MLB experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Find it on March 20th at 7 p.m. EST if you didn't hear me the first two times on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel. If you didn't hear me the first billion times on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. So in this game, I mean, there's a lot of substance you could say in this one. The Cavs dominated the Pelicans, especially in the third quarter where they just widened the gap quite a bit. Uh, They're leading 87 to 68 by the end of the third, but they outscored New Orleans 34 to 23. And I think a big figurehead and just factor in this one was Darius Garland, who in the third quarter had seven points and five assists. And we're going to count together in real time. As I type this out, 
Darius Garland's five assists resulted in three, which is a Sam Merrill three-pointer. Three, which is a Sam Merrill three-pointer. Two, which is a Karis LeVert layup. So if you're doing math at home, that's eight points. Two, which is a Jared Allen layup or points in the paint in general. That's that's ten points. Or ten points, yes. The math is mathing. Thirteen points is a George Niang, which we'll touch on in a second. And then the final assist that came in that frame was that one, the George Niang three-pointer. So the Darius Garland was responsible for 20 of Cleveland's 34 points, and that offensive production is ideally and exactly what you need, especially with a rusty and kind of uncomfortable Donovan Mitchell. But I've touched on this in the past. Um, Garland and Mitchell kind of have this thunder and lightning dynamic where Mitchell's able to bring the rumble and the thunder early into the game, allow Garland to be a little bit more differential and assist and pass to other teammates, kind of get them involved, help them all find a groove, and also help Garland find a groove in terms of just reading and reacting to the defense and kind of finding that comfort in how the opposition is going to defend him. And at least in this case, in the second half, read and react to how New Orleans may have made adjustments under Willie Green to kind of defend him differently comparatively to how he was playing in the first half. But like Mitchell was pretty one note in this quarter. He had two, the third quarter, he had two points, two assists, two rebounds. He was on one of four shooting, like wasn't remarkable stuff, but like Garland was locked in and loaded and really able to be a difference maker for the Cavs in this game. And people were kind of maybe taking their victory laps early. But again, for me, Garland isn't back 100%. I will not believe he's back until he says so because he's been pretty honest and transparent about his recovery all throughout this process, whether it's the fact that he told me that he lost 15 pounds and he's still struggling to regain weight just because, one, he was drinking smoothies with his jaw wired shut for the better part of that recovery and then still had to deal with the ramp up in general to handle the game physically so like he's not a finished product and he's had a pretty up and down season all year long but if you're ever able to put a feather in your cap and say like okay Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell work together this is a good example of it Mitchell for all that it's worth only missed a handful of games with the knee injury post PRP shots and the double overtime loss to the Chicago Bulls but Garland then was tasked with the objective of shouldering the entire offensive load on top of what he does already and then you know the the remainder of the load was on Mitchell that that was expected to go to Garland and of course to an extent Karis LeVert maybe Sam or Sam Merrill or the random guard like it's Craig Porter Jr. or something like that's out on the floor with Garland but either way like this was a very 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 like emphatic on very good Darius game and this is a good crystallization of how this partnership can work long term between Garland and Mitchell, where Garland brings the thunder and after thunder always comes lightning and that allows Garland to come on strong and they continue to coexist with one another. And it gave you some of those sameness and flashes to how they looked and functioned last year. Um, when things kind of clicked almost simultaneously and they just continue to grow off of one another and more importantly, like Mitchell's still not going to be 100%, but he's still going to command defensive attention every time he's on the floor. Like, that's just the natural nature of the beast, especially when you're dealing with a guy that is um, Cleveland's arguable MVP candidate. And um, I mean, I think he is, but people can debate in the comments below. But, um, allows Garland to continue to find his comfort and familiarity, something he's just kind of struggled to find all season long. But, Let's just do a quick swerve, like skirt, and just say, yeah, this was uh, a really good game for George Niang overall. Like, I was one of Niang's biggest critics. I was saying that maybe the Cavs should bench him outright and just play Dean Wade or Sam Merrill more than him. Um, I mean, kind of give him some insight on the situation where the Cavs are tinkering with minutes to get Sam Merrill more minutes on a nightly basis, even when this team is fully healthy and maybe Niang or another player is the casualty of that. But in this game, there's no Dean Wade who had missed the third game in a row for personal reasons. Um, Niang was phenomenal. He was four of eight from three point range and finished with 16 points, six rebounds, one assist. The five fouls are tough no matter what. Like if you're a player, you never want to rack up five fouls just because you're trying to play defense harder than the offense is pressing you. But Niang was very impactful and just like is consistently giving you that role or what you hoped from him as a player because he is a bigger player that 
can play the three. He started the three for Cleveland in this recent stretch, but mostly play the four. Um, but at least just give you big man minutes um, that can space the floor, give you a little bit of rebounding, and just more more than anything, give you more than what Dean Wade was in, which was more of that plays four spacing, more of that just three point shooting. And Niang, if he's feeling himself and he's feeling that groove, I think John Michael during the broadcast noted like. I'm going to look now like this game. He had double digits. It's the, the Suns game is currently loading for me. The Suns game. He was oh six and three point range, but he was still shooting it um, against the Nets. He had 20 points, three to five shooting from three point range. Like George Niang is starting to find his groove a lot more offensively and has been a very, very, very impactful player for the Cavs in this stretch. And that is paramount, whether he's starting, whether he's coming off the bench, you know, assumedly, I think it's fair to assume at least once Max Struess and Evan Mobley are back, George Niang will go back to the bench. But like he's carved out a very important niche and role within this offense for Cleveland and found a lot of comfort and familiarity and footing that will just make him a much more impactful player come playoff time. And um, it, it kind of just gives the Cavs like an overabundance of luxury where they have Dean Wade, they have George Niang, guys that are – Similar as bigger players that can play the three, but do have clear differences where like Wade is able to maybe play a bit more of the five than Niang can, and maybe Niang is more of strictly a four, but either way, it's semantics at this point. Um this is a good game for Niang, and I think he was just a guy who kind of kept kept hitting those like back baking breaking threes in the third quarter, at least early on, that kept the Pelicans from making this game interesting and setting this road trip off on the right note before the Cavs continue this trip before they head to Houston and before they head to Indiana which I will be talking more with the Chase Downs Justin Rowan on the Friday show more about just this upcoming road trip and the general state of the union address for, from excuse me from the the presidential representation of Cleveland Cavaliers podcast host. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves here, let's close the notebook on this win over the Pelicans. Talk about any other small notes that were very impressive in this game. Um, talked about Darius Garland. We talked about Donovan Mitchell. We talked about George Niang quite a bit in this matchup. Other than that, I think there's still a few more things to glean, but I still have to, as always, give a quick shout out to one of our many sponsors. Today's episode of Locked on Cavs is also sponsored by PrizePix. PrizePix is North America's largest daily fantasy sports platform. They are the easiest way to make picks and the most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. There's no people that you're competing with. Instead of battling thousands of players, including pros and sharks and more, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Personally, prize fix is the most fun I've had winning up to 25 times my money than this bat than any at any point in this basketball season. All I had to do was select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place my bet. Testing my skills on prize fix this basketball season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. With these skills, I can turn $10 and $250 just in a few quick taps. Price fix is simple to play. I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. It offers quick withdrawals, quick and easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types, making Price Picks the number one fantasy daily sports app. Price Fix offers weekly promotions that can lead to big pay- payouts every Taco Tuesday, each Tuesday. Price fix discounts selects player off projections of a 24% and provide even more value. Price fix also now offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits for you and your account this basketball season. So as the basketball season heats up and then the way the playoffs, check out Price Fix today. Go to pricefix.com forward slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA all lowercase for a first deposit match of 100 big ones again go to pricefix.com forward slash locked on nba use code locked on nba again all lowercase for a first deposit match of 100 dollars and enjoy daily fantasy sports made easy 
This episode of Locked on Cavs is also brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that you, if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this. Now, from April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right. No cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for the retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com forward slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now, I do have to disclose some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 valid dated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. A 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of your first 3% match. Must You must keep an IRA Robinhood account for five years. The 3% matching on transfers to the subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers only in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SPIC is a registered broker dealer. Okay, well, thanks to Robinhood and their diamond hands and prize picks for making daily fantasy sports even easier than before. But looking ahead and also just looking at the final notes of this game, the, the Cavs were very, very solid, whether it was from a coaching aspect. I think J.B. Bickerstaff coached his pants off in this matchup, found really creative ways to get Donovan Mitchell rolling, or just the fact that coaching-wise, he knew the right guys to lean on from his bench, which I don't know if he had on your bingo card, because I sure as heck didn't, but Damian Jones was incredibly impactful in this matchup for Cleveland. He finished with 14 points on 78 shooting, six rebounds, two fouls, which you take as a big man, a steal, and a turnover, whereas Sam Merrill had 15 points, a, I believe, career-high nine assists and two rebounds in this matchup, with all 15 of his points coming from the perimeter on 5-10 shooting. But first on Jones... It's refreshing to see him finally look a little bit more comfortable and familiar within this lineup and rotation. It's unfortunate it took this long to get to this point for him, but if you're getting this from Cleveland, this is why you made the trade with the Utah Jazz in the first place to send them cash to go get a backup big man to relieve Jared Allen for a spell, and he more than did that. He played almost 21 minutes, whereas Allen only played 32. Um and it's up a 48 minute game. The math is mathing there again, folks. But um, no, Jones was great in this one. He's starting to look a lot more comfortable. I think the encore chemistry he has with Darius Garland or just any of Cleveland's guards is really encouraging, too, just because you naturally don't expect a big man to create for you as much as possible at offense. They're very reliant on guards. And the fact that he kind of has a niche and a role and a level of comfort that just kind of has him gelling a little bit makes you wonder, like, Tristan Thompson is back Saturday against the Rockets. Does J.B. Bakerstaff lean on Jones still to kind of give Allen a bit of a bit of a reprieve, or does Bakerstaff turn to a now completely dry PED wise Tristan Thompson to give Jared Allen or God willing, if like Evan Mobley's back or even Dean Wade or George Niang, a brief pause so that you're not overtaxing them with minutes of the big man spot, but. At least in my eyes, Jones has been very good for the Cavs in this last stretch, and he's really taken advantage of the fact that the Cavs have caught on his number because they're short on depth, um, especially just with Evan Mobley sidelined, and have done a really, really good job of just responding to the challenge presented to him, and he played really well. But I kind of tip my cap at this a little bit, but the Cavs by design are giving or finding more ways to get Sam Merrill minutes just because Sam is dynamic for the team offensively especially when there is no max Struess available like you need that movement shooting you need that floor stretching that merrill can give you it, it certainly helps and i think it in fact makes life easier for guys like george niang because they're not dealing with so much defensive pressure or even darius garland who was six to ten from the floor donovan mitchell or from three-point range rather for garland four of nine from three-point range for mitchell um, like it makes life easier across the Rubicon for Cleveland if they have guys that can unblock the offense. And Struess is certainly in that vein. He's going to be a guy who's a heavy minute getter when he's 100%. But having a, an extra option in Merrill just makes it a lot more palatable and presentable for the Cavs to kind of find some familiarity and balance. Like 
I don't know if Merrill's in the playoff rotation or anything like that. You'd have to assume that it's the quote unquote core four plus truce for the starting lineup. And it's Isaac Okoro, Karis Levert for sure in the bench rotation minutes. And you're going about eight, maybe nine players top come postseason time. And it, it becomes a chalk up. Like, do you want to play George Niang? Do you want to play Sam Merrill? Do you want to play golly Craig Porter Jr. if you want to as well? Maybe um other guys too, like maybe Ty Jerome just becomes healthy all of a sudden and finally plays for the first time since Cleveland's home opening loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder back in October. Just to crystallize that, but neither here nor there. Um yeah, I, I think Merrill's done plenty to earn minutes. I think he's done enough to earn consideration come playoff time, but I think it is going to be more matchup based. But like, at least for Merrill, it's become clear to me that you're willing to ride out the the cold streaks that he deals with to watch him kind of find a groove like he did against the Pelicans because he does have the potential to go off once he sees the ball and go go in once or twice. And also, I completely blanked. I didn't even mention Dean Wade, who should be in the playoff rotation as well. And But either way, between Merrill, Niang, and Wade, it's going to kind of be in a toss-up based on the matchup or just like if you want to go bigger, yeah, you play more minutes to Wade and Niang and less to Merrill. But if you're able to find ways to let Merrill pick a part of team on the perimeter, because especially if they don't have the wing support or you can maybe exploit some of the bigs that the opposing team has come playoff time. Like, yeah, you can find the minutes and the opportunities for Sam Barrow, but a really good win for the Cavs. I think this is a really, really good tone setter after a pretty topsy-turvy stretch over the last 10, especially without Donovan Mitchell and without Evan Mobley. And, and maybe instead of limping towards the finish line into the postseason, the Cavs start to build some pretty good momentum in – what's typically considered some pretty crappy basketball overall. And, you know, if the other team wants to suck it up and the Cavs want to suck up their failures and turn it into success, more power to them. But it'll be exciting to see. It'll be interesting to see what happens next when they play the Houston Rockets and Indiana Pacers. Chris will be talking more about the Rockets game in depth on Saturday. But before that, I'll be joined by the Chase Downs Justin Rowan before that to talk all about the state of the Cleveland Cavaliers as the two podcast presidents for the Cleveland Cavaliers space. But uh, if you liked my voice, my name's Evan Damarell. I run the show at Write Down Euclid, where we're a nonprofit news organization that is 100% supported by viewer donations. Hint, hint. And we cover the Cleveland sports scene at large with fully credentialed access and behind the scenes coverage that you may not find elsewhere or just, you know, are the simple, simple boilerplate PRBS that you grown accustomed to. And that's unacceptable, but I'll be back tomorrow with Justin Rowan. You'll hear less of me and more of him. Um, but yeah, it won't be a debate. It'll be a joining of friends because Carter Rodriguez is too good to ever come on the show. But until then, I'm Evan Damerell. Jake Marrier produced this show. Uh, Chris Manning, be careful with the cartel. Until then, love you all. Bye.